I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This Golden Globe nominated Jedi is a dedicated actor who gives his mind, body, and soul to every performance. Hayden Christensen was gifted or cursed with probably the most challenging role of all time, with expectations that stretch to a galaxy far, far away. But he also made some waves as a dramatic actor in smaller movies that don't have lightsabers or spaceships. There is so much more to this man than just whining in front of green screens. Hayden has actually tackled many interesting roles. Roles that should have made him the biggest star on the planet, but they didn't. Some fanboys really love him and some fanboys really hate him. But that's okay, in fact, that's what makes this man so interesting. Over the years, he's kind of vanished. You know, like a dead Jedi. And just like a dead Jedi, when you strike down Hayden Christensen, he becomes more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So let us begin your training in the career of Hayden Christensen, so that we can take a deep dive into his life as a house. Whatever the f*** that means. In other words, what the f*** happened to Hayden Christensen? Excuse me for just a moment. But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Hayden Christensen, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1981, Vancouver, British Columbia. That's in Canada from what I'm told. He got his start at a very young age in commercials on the television selling products to the masses. Then he appeared in a soap opera called Family Passions at the age of 12. His big screen debut would come by way of master filmmaker John Carpenter in the vastly underrated classic In the Mouth of Madness with Sam Neill. Look at that little phantom menace riding his bike. In 1995, he would take on several roles in several projects such as Love and Betrayal, The Mia Farrow Story, Street Law, Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, and No Greater Love. Then, in 1997, he would appear in the popular TV adaptation of Goosebumps in the classic episode, Night of the Living Dummy 3. And if you grew up in the 90s, this one gave you nightmares, and still is. But not me, because I'm not scared of nothing. Alright. 1998 would see him appear in a Kirsten Dunst film, Strike, followed by a thriller called Freefall. In 1999, he would star in a televised anthology series for children called Real Kids, Real Adventures, playing Eli Goodner in an episode called Paralyzed, the Eli Goodner Story. He would then appear on another television series that if you grew up in the 90s gave you nightmares and still is, Are You Afraid of the Dark? But not me, because I'm not even afraid of the dark. But he would appear in the classic episode, The Tale of Bigfoot Ridge. Then we would see young Hayden Christensen appear in the very well-received Sofia Coppola masterpiece, The Virgin Suicides. He played one of those boys. He then would appear in a few more television projects, such as the Disney Channel's The Famous Jet Jackson. It's the Famous Jet Jackson. Followed by the TV movie Trapped in a Purple Haze in the year 2000, the new millennium. And he would have a lead role in the short-lived Fox family show Higher Ground. I don't want to talk about this script. There's nothing to talk about. It's me or the cops. I'm not going anywhere with anybody. Don't send me home. But then came the year 2001, when he received unanimous praise for his role in the drama Life as a House, where he plays an angry, whiny teenager. And he's really good at it, so uh, you can kind of see the beginnings of Anakin in Life as a House. 
But yeah, let's we can talk about Star Wars later. Let's talk about life as a house. It it deserves to be talked about. Christensen actually improvised the wall punch after finding out that his father is dying. That's a that's a spoiler kinda. But there was no padding on the wall. So his improvised punch really hurt his hand. And they had to shoot the scene several times from several angles, so he had to keep doing it. And he refused to add padding to the wall. So at the end of the day, his hand was badly injured. Like like Anakin. Just saying. He puts his blood, sweat, and tears into his work, and bones, and skin, and, and everything. Fuck you! Hayden Christensen is a pro, you guys. And that devotion to his craft paid off, as Hayden Christensen would garner much praise for this performance, even landing several nominations, including Outstanding performance by a male in a supporting role at the Screen Actors Guild Awards, and Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role at the Golden Globe Awards. If you care about the Golden Globes. So there Hayden was, sitting there at the Golden Globes, surrounded by the Hollywood elite, and he's like, Yes, I am now one of you. I'm now part of the council. I'm now a master. I'll hate you for the rest of my life. Well, you can't even begin to know how much I hate my father. Think of it as a family tradition. But yeah, life as a house, this tear jerker really jerked out those tears from a lot of people's eye sockets, and, and, and they, they remembered, and everyone was like, this Hayden Christensen guy, he's the next big thing. He's gonna do things. He's gonna change the universe. But will that be a good thing or a bad thing? Actually, to this day, we still aren't sure. Are you wearing eye makeup? No. So yes, now we get to the biggie. The reason why most of us know who Hayden Christensen is. The, all of us know who Hayden Christensen is. The role that many sought after, but only one got. Anakin Skywalker. Over 1,500 young actors auditioned for the role, including people like Paul Walker, Christian Bale, Heath Ledger, and even Leonardo DiCaprio. And it makes you wonder what they would have done with this role and what it would have done to their careers. The casting director said she knew the second that she opened the door and saw Christensen that he was unique and that he was the right man for the job. She said that when they turned on the camera and the audition began, Christensen gave her goosebumps. Hey, he was on Goosebumps. But she couldn't show any enthusiasm on her face as he auditioned because, you know, she's a professional. But when he left the room, casting director Robin Gerland knew that she had found Anakin Skywalker. She even called George Lucas immediately to let him know that young Darth Vader just walked through her doors. To be honest, I went in with no expectations. I really wasn't thinking that, you know, oh, I really want this part. It was just, wow, you know, that's George Lucas. This is cool. Lucas said that he saw both good and dark sides in Christensen, and that is why he was ultimately cast. Because they needed someone to play the good in Anakin while slowly turning to the darkness to ultimately become the ultimate villain of all time. Darth Vader! George Lucas wanted someone with a James Dean edge to him, and Hayden apparently had that. According to Mr. George Lucas, Christensen could not stop making the lightsaber sound when they were filming, you know. Lucas then had to stop and say, hey, hey, we'll, we'll add that in post. But I'm sure we can all relate, it's almost impossible to act out a lightsaber fight without making that sound. Try it, try it right now, everybody. It's impossible. And say what you want about Hayden Christensen's performance, the man is dedicated like a movie-making beast. He's so good that he does his own stunt work, mostly. Actually, the stunt double was seldom used. Hayden wanted to show that he could do it himself. 
Hayden did his homework. He did his research. He even studied the speech patterns of James Earl Jones. He was really, really trying his best, you guys. <laughs> no! And of course, anything and everything that has been said about the dialogue in the prequels has been said, and bottom line, yeah, it's not that good. But there is a scene where Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman got a chance to improvise. Lucas didn't like the dialogue he wrote for the aggressive negotiation scene. So he was just like, Hayden, Natalie, ad-lib. Whose line is it anyway? Just, just do that. And that's what you see in the final cut. Many respected psychologists around the world have said that Anakin Skywalker displays the classic characteristics of somebody with borderline personality disorder. And to that I say, well, duh, he's Darth Vader. But he does make a good point about sand. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. And yeah, it's really, really hard to get a real true performance when you're just surrounded by the color green. Which is actually why Hayden Christensen's favorite scene was the bar scene, because it was an actual set. And not just, you know, a green screen, like, like the rest of the movie. Jedi business, go back to your drinks. So yeah, that movie Life as a House, it gave Christensen a taste of the award season love. But this movie, Star Wars 2 Attack of the Clones, showed him the flip side of that love. He would win the Golden Raspberry Award, or the, the Razzie, that's what the common folk call it, for Worst Supporting Actor and would be nominated for Worst On-Screen Couple alongside Natalie Portman. The film Star Wars Episode II Attack of the Clones was a massive hit pulling in $654 million worldwide off a $115 million budget. However, this was the first Star Wars movie to not be the top earning film of the year, falling behind Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and Spider-Man. Critical consensus of the film said that it was slightly better than the poorly received Phantom Menace. However, most still found the script to be underwritten and the acting was wooden. Many, many people have labeled Hayden Christensen's performance as soulless, almost brainwashed, like a machine in his tone. But that's kind of exactly the type of person who would grow up to be Darth Vader. So I'm just saying, maybe it's brilliant. I don't know, who am I to say? I hate them! In between Star Wars movies, Hayden Christensen would star as a real-life disgraced journalist named Stephen Glass in the film Shattered Glass in 2003. This film right here is proof positive that when Christensen is given some good writing and strong direction, he knocks it out of the park. This film received very strong reviews with near unanimous praise for Hayden's performance. He shattered expectations with shattered glass. The film was a limited release though, premiering at several film festivals before being released on eight screens in New York and Los Angeles, where it ultimately made $3 million. Okay, uh, I feel really attacked. And you're my editor, you're supposed to support me, and you're taking their word against mine? You're supposed to support me! Then in 2004, there was a re-release of Return of the Jedi on DVD, and in a controversial move that saw fanboys rise from their basements to express their outrage, madman movie maker George Lucas decided for the sake of continuity with the prequels, to remove actor Sebastian Shaw and replace him with Hayden Christensen as the Force Ghost of Anakin in that final scene for Return of the Jedi. So what do you guys think? Uh, was was it uh, was it the right move to, to throw him in there? Does, does continuity matter? Does anything matter anymore? Comment your comment in the comments. Then, in 2005, came Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith, 
And of course, Hayden was dedicated to the role once again, putting on 24 pounds, eating six meals a day. And of course, everybody talks about Anakin's hair in this one, and George Lucas told the hairstylist that Anakin's hair could not look cute. It had to look rugged. What do you guys think? Is that rugged? Is that rugged enough for y'all? Episode 3 was released on Thursday, May 19th, 2005, and still remains the highest Thursday box office gross ever. And this film got the best reviews for the prequel trilogy, with most people thoroughly enjoying the darker tone. But again, there was massive criticism of the dialogue. And many people called Hayden Christensen's performance lackluster. There was no luster, he was lacking the luster, they said. The film would go on to pull 868 million worldwide, becoming the second highest grossing movie of 2005. Once again, falling behind Harry Potter. The Goblet of Fire beat the Star Wars. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> so with that Star Wars fame propelling Hayden Christensen to leading man status, he could do anything he wanted. And what did he want to do? He, he wanted to do an indie film called Factory Girl, opposite Sienna Miller. It's a biopic about uh, Andy Warhol's muse, Edie Sedwick. Christensen plays Bob Dylan, but he doesn't really play Bob Dylan in the movie he's just called Musician. Sometimes they call him Billy Quinn. The real Bob Dylan actually threatened to sue the producers because the script strongly hints that maybe Bob Dylan may have been responsible for her death. And Bob Dylan didn't think that was cool. So Hayden Christensen is not playing Bob Dylan. He's not there. Speaking of not being there, uh, I actually thought this was a pretty good Bob Dylan performance until I saw the movie I'm Not There. Factory Girl suffered from horrid reviews calling the film empty, yet everyone liked Sienna Miller's performance. The film only made three and a half million dollars on a seven million dollar budget. It had potential, but, but no. Lady, you don't know shit about shit. He would then star opposite Jessica Alba in Awake playing a billionaire who is awake during a heart transplant only to discover that the surgeon and his wife are planning to murder him. So you see, the title actually serves two purposes. He's awake during the procedure, but he's also awake to the plot to kill him. That's some A-plus wordplay there, which I'm awake to. Jared Leto was the original choice, but they couldn't get him, so they got Hayden Christensen! Reception for the film was very poor, with many calling it a very interesting plot that was wasted by poor directing, acting, and editing. Yikes. The film did manage to pull in $32 million, though, which isn't great, but it, it really isn't that bad. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Come on, man, just swallow it. Then in 2007, Christensen would re-virginize himself with Virgin Territory. It's a movie. It's a cheesy, direct-to-video, medieval sex comedy. You know, one of those. The film is set during the Black Death, because when you think funny, sexy comedy time, you think the bubonic plague, right? Do you think we should take off his clothes to see if he's broken any bones? I think we should, just to be sure. Christensen's next high-profile film was the teleportation thriller Jumper, reuniting Christensen with the bad motherfucker himself, Samuel L. Jackson. This is one of the few films that actually got permission to film inside the real Roman Colosseum, so that's cool. And Eminem, the hip-hop rapper guy, was the original choice to star in this film, but they couldn't get him, so they got Hayden Christensen! But once the director met with Hayden Christensen, he knew that he was perfect for the part. For the jumper. Christensen and co-star Rachel Bilson were romantically involved while filming this movie, ultimately having a child together. 
So the chemistry you see on screen, it's real. The film received pretty bad reviews, with most saying that the action was incoherent and the special effects were lackluster. They lacked the luster, the luster they did lack. Actually, there is a very large cult following to this film, and many people have said to give it a second chance. So give it a second chance, you guys. Jumper is actually a good movie. Dare I say it? Yes, I dare. The film would ultimately end up making a little over $225 million off an $85 million budget. So yeah, Jumper. Jump to your nearest blockbuster and rent it. Christensen would continue his romantic rendezvous with Rachel Bilson in the anthology film New York I Love You. Christensen, Bilson, and Andy Garcia starred in the segment Steal Your Heart. The film received poor reviews, saying that in an anthology film you're only as good as your weakest link, and New York I Love You suffers from an inconsistent tone. You need to keep your tone consistent, you guys. In the United States, this film made $1.5 million, but internationally, it made $13 million. Interesting, interesting. I don't know what that means, but I'm just gonna say interesting. Christensen would next be seen in the ensemble heist film Takers. This movie's actually kind of cool, and Hayden Christensen wears, wears a really cool hat. Look at that hat. He says he just looks good in it. Critics found the film to have some solid action, but that alone could not overshadow the cliched script. Although, Stephen King would disagree with those haters because he listed this movie, Takers, as number five on his top films of 2010 of the year. So if you care what Stephen King thinks, he likes this movie. The film pulled in a fairly solid 80 million off a 32 million dollar budget. And I remember when this movie was out and I was like, hey yeah, maybe Hayden Christensen is gonna have a little uh, interesting comeback here. But uh, that didn't really happen and his career kind of vanished. Speaking of vanishing, he was in a movie called Vanishing on 7th Street. It's a post-apocalyptic thriller that was originally released on Zune <laughs> and Xbox Live prior to its theatrical release on six screens in the United States where it made a whopping $22,000. Reviews for the film were split with most appreciating the subtle approach to the material while others saying that the film simply could not hold their interest throughout. And holding interests is is important when you're a movie. Ah! No! Then Darth Vader got to work with Darth Vader, in a way. Hayden Christensen and James Earl Jones would lend their voice to the NASA-produced IMAX educational and fun sci-fi epic film. Quantum Quest. Hayden Christensen plays like a hippie surfer crocodile in space? You know, cause it's educational and fun from, from NASA. And the only way to watch this movie was at like the Kentucky Space Center. But it was released on IMAX theatrically in Asia. If you live in Asia, a lot of people live in Asia. Come and see Quantum Quest the movie. You'll have a lot of fun and you'll even learn a few things. And after a four year break, that's right, four years, we went four years without seeing Hayden Christensen. He would team up in 2014 with legend Nicolas Cage for the directive video film Outcast, about a young murderous commander during the Crusades. Critics called Christensen's performance lifeless, and the film was a wannabe epic. Well, Hayden is somebody I've admired for a while. He's also a lovely man. He's a very nice man. And I hope to continue our friendship. Christensen would then team up with another Oscar winner who went to the direct-to-video wastelands, Adrian Brody, 
in American Heist. It's about two brothers who would take on a heist in America. So like, like an American heist. I get it. The film lost a lot of money, like, like millions and millions of dollars. So the heist didn't really work. <laughs> 2015, we would see Christensen pop up in one movie, the Christian drama 90 Minutes in Heaven. And one pesky critic said that a better title would have been 121 Minutes in Purgatory. Ouch. The film cost $5 million to make and made $4.8 million at the box office. Then he went on another hiatus, this one was for two years, that's right, we went two years without seeing Hayden Christensen in anything. This time he would return again to the direct-to-video bin with Bruce Willis, of all people, in a movie called First Kill. Then in 2018, we would see Christensen in a movie called Little Italy, and it seemed like many critics and many people in the audience didn't really have an appetite for Little Italy. And this is one of those movies that, you know, when you're looking at one of those lists of the worst movies of the year, you would always see this one on those lists during the year of 2018. It's just, it's just not good, and, and movies should be good. You can take the girl out of Little Italy, but you can't take Little Italy out of the girl. Then in 2019, Christensen would team up with Harvey Keitel for a limited release of a movie called The Last Man. And when I say limited release, I mean very limited because this movie made $12,000 at the box office. Many critics called this film very unpleasant from start to finish, with Christensen's performance once again taking a heavy beating by people that just don't understand him. There's someone out there. The Last Man. Anakin Skywalker almost kinda returned in a way. Doesn't he have a voice cameo in Force Awakens or something? Not sure if that really counts, but there was some very intriguing concept art that was developed just in case Anakin decided to return for The Force Awakens for some reason. But of course he did not. Probably for the best, but that is some kind of cool concept art. Let's take a moment to appreciate what almost was and could have been. Wow. So now, let us look to the future, 2022, Anno Domini. Hayden Christensen seems to have realized that sometimes you have to lean into what made your career to begin with. And he will be doing that in a big way in the future, 2022 Anno Domini, when he reprises that role that made him a household name. In, in nerdy households. That's right, Hayden Christensen will once again be Anakin Skywalker. Darth Vader. In the Disney Plus series Obi-Wan Kenobi opposite Ewan McGregor. And I'm pretty dang sure that this dang thing is gonna be pretty dang huge. And we're all about to witness a mega comeback for Hayden Christensen. No, 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 not just a comeback, a resurrection. Back to the stars. The Star Wars on, on the Disney Plus. Christensen was a guy who seemed to just be thrown into the limelight with the highly sought after role of the man who would become Darth Vader. And with that came expectations that no actor could meet. But one must look at the roles surrounding those Star Wars to know that Christensen is a talent worth watching. Whether as a young man coming to grips with his father's impending death, or as a journalist taking down a scandal, Hayden Christensen can do it all. And he did. And he's still doing it. I will flat out say that some of the criticism Christensen received for his performance in Star Wars was 
a bit misplaced. Those films suffered from dialogue that Sir Lawrence Olivier, or Sir Anthony Hopkins, or any other sir for that matter would struggle with. So it's not his fault, you guys. I'm a Jedi. I know I'm better than this. His casting as Anakin both made his career and ultimately doomed him. But it appears in 2022, Anno Domini, the future, we may finally get to see the version of his Anakin that we've all been waiting for. Not many people get second chances like this, so Hayden, you better not f*** this up, please. I believe in you. I really do. And with that, 20 years later, Hayden Christensen may finally get the respect that he deserves for playing one of the greatest villains in cinematic history. Hayden did one of the most unthinkable and respectable things ever. He walked away from fame. Enough red carpets and flashing lights for this man. Until that Obi-Wan Kenobi show comes out. And actually, this Jedi right here used his powers for good. After Star Wars, he bought a ranch, turning Darth Vader back into a simple farm boy and he's just enjoying raising his daughter. So nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Hayden Christensen, cause he's doing just fine. Plus, he's like one of the best memes out there on the World Wide Web, so yeah, there's, there's that. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.